All right, getting a bunch of videos done today, but we're going to be in Revelation chapter 14. Been uh, going out of here for about an hour. Um, got a couple other things I need to get done too. Some articles that were sent to me, I need to get those out. So, but uh, pretty good stuff here in Revelation chapter 14. Uh, let's start out here. Revelation 14, verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Okay? Very interesting. Keep your hand there, if you want, and go back to Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Okay? Now, we aren't going to go there, but Revelation chapter 13 talks about the mark being in the forehead. You see what's going on there? Is this the same thing? No, it's uh, the theme that's carried throughout the scriptures, and that is that Satan will always counterfeit what God does. It's very important to remember that. So you have people and they say, you know, I saw Jesus and stuff, and you go, okay, wait a second. I don't see that in my Bible. Uh, who are they seeing? Oh, probably a counterfeit. There's going to be a man that shows up not too far off in the future, and uh, he's going to be the Antichrist. He's a counterfeit for Jesus Christ. How do you know? Read Revelation chapter 6 where it talks about the rider on the white horse being loosed. Jesus looses the, the rider on the white horse. When Jesus Christ comes back in Revelation 19, he's riding a white horse. And there's so many other things that you can do comparing Satan, what he appears as and what he does and things like this, to Jesus Christ. It's quite an interesting study. So you've got to be real careful, real careful. Uh, when people start to get away from this book and they start to tell you it needs to be changed or this shouldn't be there and whatever else, you better be real careful of that. Verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Okay. Um, just thought that was pretty interesting there. Because when you think of mighty water and you think of thunder, they are very similar. And uh, I remember years ago, my wife and I, when we were down in northwestern Pennsylvania, we went to Niagara Falls the one time, met a sister that lived up in that area, and she took us over to Niagara Falls and uh, while we were there. And it was, it was incredible. I mean, the volume of water that goes over top of that thing, and it goes down, you know, and it hits and everything else. And, and the mist comes up, and you're, like, just getting drenched, you know, standing there trying to look down in and stuff. I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible. And to think of... When God speaks, He's so powerful and so awesome in His might that it's going to be like thunder and the sound of many waters. Really incredible, you know. Um, verse 3, And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. I thought that was very interesting there. No man could learn that song. Hmm. Um, you know, we liked some classical music and things once in a while. You know, we don't, uh, I mean, we listen to hymns as much as we can, but there's kind of in short supply many times. Uh, you, you try to put up any kind of hymns on YouTube and they end up getting flagged for copyright violation and things. Good old YouTube, but, uh, you know. But uh, sometimes we'll watch some classical music and uh, we watched a performance by a guy, um, Leonard Bernstein and uh, back in 1976 and we saw a more modern performance of that same piece and uh, musical piece and it was like not even close you know I mean it was it was really bad it was pretty poor performance and uh, you know it was just kind of like we were laughing about it and saying this here's this you know Jewish guy and lost you I understand but he just master piece playing this 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 uh, song and years and years later, somebody else tries to mimic it, and, you know, they don't even get close. And it was just kind of like, I thought about that while I was reading this text, and I thought, you know, it says there, they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and no man could learn that song. And I thought, 
It's kind of interesting. I think that a lot of the composers of the past did some really amazing stuff, and you get modern people. They can't even come close, close to playing it. But even with all the talent and all the skill that's out there down through hundreds and hundreds of years of man's history and, and great pieces and composers and symphonies and orchestras and all this other stuff, um, there's going to be a song one day that only the Lord and the 144,000, they're going to be the only ones that can play this song. That's pretty incredible when you think about it, to be able to get up there to heaven and you hear music that nobody on earth can duplicate. You know, and a lot of people down here on the earth, it's kind of funny, they, they say, I don't believe in stuff up in heaven because I can't understand it. Yes, <laughs> that's why it's heaven. <laughs> you know, if we could understand everything about heaven and everything about God and, and, and everything, you know, the Bible talks about the mystery of godliness. We can't figure out God with the minds that we have down here on this earth. And even the music up there is beyond anything that we've ever heard before. We're not going to get up there and say, you know, that reminds me of that one song by Mozart or Beethoven or any of them. Uh-uh. It's going to be a level of music that's just... I can't even fathom it. It's going to be amazing. But... Um, Go to uh, Psalm 47, back to the Old Testament. I'm going to show you an interesting couple of verses here. Psalm 47. Verses 5 through 9. This is an interesting one here. Psalm 47, verse 5. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Wow, with a shout, we go up, and God's voice sounds like a trumpet. thought that was pretty interesting. Verse 6, sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises unto our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing ye praises with understanding. I remember back in my days when I listened to a Christian heavy metal, which was absurd, <laughs> There's no such thing. It's an oxymoron. It's like Christian pornography or something. There's no such thing as Christian heavy metal. But I remember back when I'd listen to it and different people say to me, do you understand what they're saying? And a lot of times I was like, no, I'd have to look at the lyrics. <laughs> this is praise and worship music, but I don't, I don't have a clue what they're saying. <laughs> well, then that's a problem. It doesn't qualify because verse 7 says, sing ye praises with understanding. And, you know, again, you know, get a lot of this modern CCM stuff, it's got like all these veiled meanings and stuff, you know, because they don't want to offend lost people with their music. But the old hymns, the old hymns are wonderful. Um, verse 8, God reigneth over the heathen, God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the, of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong unto God, he is greatly exalted. I do believe we are supposed to praise the Lord. And uh, congregational singing, if you can get a bunch of Christians together and sing some hymns, it's a wonderful thing. Um, but, you know, again, you get into the whole Babel building deal and it starts getting a little carnal, you know. And, and uh, I mean, the stories I can tell of people, you know, doing special music and the pride and stuff that's associated. And, but uh, we'll continue. I um, thought it was interesting. John chapter 4, verse 24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Yeah. Again, God's not interested in music that just is whatever. God wants to be praised according to his word. Very important. Let's look at verses 4 and 5 here in Revelation 14. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now again, let me just remind you, because there's probably people out there saying, you're not expositing this correctly. That's not the point of these studies. Okay, The point of these studies is instruction and in righteousness for Christians today. I'm not going to get into who the 144,000 are. They're 144,000 Jewish virgin males, okay? 
whether they're little boys or, or young men or teenagers or older men, whatever. Okay, we're not going to get into that. All right, that's other people have done those studies. We're trying to find things here as exhortation for us as Christians. All right, so what can we learn from that? Well, an important thing. First Peter, go to First Peter chapter 2. Verses 21 through 23. And this is good instruction in righteousness. Again, you can get instruction in righteousness from anywhere in the Bible. Be careful doctrine. You have to rightly divide. All right? Instruction in righteousness is going to be there, though, the whole way through Scripture. Verse 21. Let's start there. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also hath also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Okay? It's a good example. You have to be careful. You have to be very careful what you're saying when you're in Christian ministry. All right? And before the little wing nuts out there cut up my videos and, and have me rebuking people and stuff like this, you have to remember Jesus Christ did rebuke people, and he is certainly going to do a really good job of rebuking people when he comes back in Revelation 19. It's called killing 200 million pe men. Well, it could be probably people, you know, probably men and women in that one world government, you know, army. But because uh, you've got women in the military now, but uh, side issue. But, you know, the Lord is not saying, the Bible is not saying here that he just, you can't ever speak negatively of anybody. You can Okay, when you see the people that are Pharisees or changing the word or things like that, uh, rebuke them harshly. Certainly that's there. But be careful. Don't go too far with it. Don't get to a point where they're making you so angry that you end up losing your cool and you start to swear at them. You start to cuss them out. All right, that's what's going on there. Calling people names, I know it's, it's a little, you know, you shouldn't do that politically correct stuff and whatever else. But... People are called names all throughout Scripture. Jesus calls people names. Paul calls people names. It's there. All right? There is sarcasm in the Bible. It's there. You know, whatever. Deal with it. But be careful that you don't get so angry that you start to cuss someone out. That's the whole point there. All right? Why? Well, go back to Revelation 14. Um, verse 5, And in their mouth was found no guile. They weren't swearing. For they are without fault before the throne of God. All right? It's important for you to watch your language. Okay, let's go one other place here quickly to the book of James. Chapter 3. It says here, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. All right? And if you go down to verse 8, you can read this whole chapter. It's really good, but we'll just skip ahead here. Verse 8, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. You're not supposed to be cursing, cussing people out and things as a Christian. Your speech is supposed to change when you get saved. You see, when you become a new creature in Christ Jesus, you're going to see things will start to change subtly. Um, you know, I... As a lost man, I was a professing Christian too, by the way, but I would hang out with, you know, popular guys in high school and stuff like that, and they'd be swearing, so I'd swear, you know, and uh, I knew it was wrong, but I wasn't saved. I wasn't born again, so there was really no, you know, real Holy Spirit conviction there, right? I got saved, and it was interesting because I used to, I used to be like a diehard uh, movie addict, you know, Hollywood movie addict. And I remember I got saved, and uh, it just was like I could I could not hear profanity anymore. It was just like oh, just oh, it bothered me. And I remember the one time we got this 
I was with some relatives and they were like, hey, let's rent a movie. And I was kind of like, eh, you know, it was early on in my salvation. You know, I shouldn't have even consented to it, but it was a stupid mistake. You know, you'll, you'll do stuff like that. You know, I still make stupid mistakes too, you know, if you haven't noticed that. But, um, you know, yeah, okay, let's get this movie. And I thought, well, you know, I remember watching that movie years ago and I really liked it and it didn't have that much profanity in it. Boy, was I shocked. There was so much profanity in that movie. What was going on? Well, I was a lost man. It didn't bother me. You know, sometimes, you know, I shouldn't have said that or whatever. Excuse my French. You know, you do that thing. Uh, see, as a lost person, it doesn't really sink in up here. So one of the quickest ways that you can tell if somebody's saved or lost is by their speech. You remember when Peter was outside, you know, when Jesus is being put on trial there, essentially, and this woman comes up to him and she goes, you're one of his disciples, aren't you? And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And she says, thy speech bereath thee. And what did Peter do? He began to cuss and swear. See? When you are using a lot of profanity, the lost world is going to look at you and they're going to say, they're not saved. There's something that changes there. So I see preachers and professing Christians that use profanity and I say, simple test, they're not saved. Interesting. But let's continue here. Revelation chapter 14, um, verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Hmm. Um, what is the everlasting gospel? The, the one that's always been preached. You know, I, I just, I, there's so many things that I just like shake my head and I go, lost people are just so <laughs> ridiculous. It's the, the everlasting gospel has been from Genesis to Revelation. Wow. So Adam and Eve believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, just the same as somebody, you know, before Jesus died on the cross. They believed in it. Faith, justified by faith, you know. And somebody at the end of the millennial kingdom, where they can clearly see Jesus sitting on a throne in Jerusalem, they're saved the same way. Wow, that's incredible. What on earth were they doing the whole way through the Old Testament with the animal sacrifices and Levitical priesthood and, you know, you have to do this and you're unclean until this and you know, all that stuff. We don't have to do it today. What were they doing it for back then? We're all saved by the same gospel, the everlasting gospel. Cuckoo. Cuckoo nutty birds. Uh, Non-dispensational Christians, I grant you there's people that don't understand it. All right, you can watch some of my videos where I explain it. But, you know, if you understand the arguments for dispensationalism and you flat out, I reject the dispensational teaching, you're lost. <laughs> Just as simple as that. The Holy Spirit's not going to inspire somebody to be that dumb. I mean, you know, you, you, you see dispensational teaching and you start to understand it. The Lord starts to reveal it to you and you go, that makes sense. That's how you line everything up. Oh, wow. You know, it's like this wonderful revelation that comes from the Lord. You go, now it makes sense. I was trying to figure out how to reconcile everything here. You know, what is the everlasting gospel? We're going to read about it in the next couple of verses. It's actually defined, but, uh, and we're going to see it's not the same gospel we have today. So, oh, Brian Dillinger's teaching another gospel. He's teaching another gospel. Heretic. I get that a lot more, you know, more often now, you know, the, the heretic claim and stuff like this. And I'm like, well, you know, that's about right because Catholicism is coming more into open power and control now. So it's about right that they're starting to, you know, do the cry of heretic. Um, and I guarantee you, a lot of these people, they'd love to see me burned at the stake. They'd throw a party if I was executed for what I preach and teach. Don't kid yourself. Oh, no, you know, we, we, we don't agree with you, Brother Ryan, but we, you know, and they always call me brother. I'm like, what are you, stupid or something? You're not my brother, you know. If you're non-dispensational and easy believism and stuff like that, you're not my brother. You know, I'm not going to call you brother, unless it's by mistake and I don't know who you are yet. But, but let's look about this thing of the other gospel. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. 
I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Lordship salvation, people do it. Easy believes in people do it. Okay? Catholics do it with their works salvation, where it's maintaining perpetual works. I am being saved, you know, like the Catholic Bibles will read. You're not saved, you're a being saved. That's what they do. Verse 8, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ." I don't seek to please men. I mean, even my worst enemies can admit that. That Brian is not a man pleaser. Okay? I get plenty of people mad at me. All right? Um, but you see, the whole thing is here, uh, Paul saying, here's the gospel. This is the way it's supposed to be. And the only time it can change is when you get an angel. Revelation chapter 14. When an angel, though we are an angel. Okay? You have an angel. The gospel's changed. What is the gospel? What is the everlasting gospel? Let's see it. Verse 7. Okay, he's preaching the everlasting gospel in verse 6. Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Okay? So you have... Two basic things there. We could say three, actually. We'll make it three. Fear God and give glory to Him. The hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him. Okay? That's what is called the everlasting gospel. Right there. What do we have there? Fear God and give glory to Him. Well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Or to give glory to Him right now? Sure. Absolutely. But is there a new aspect of fearing God that appears in the time of Jacob's trouble? Yes. All right? I'm not worried about losing my salvation right now. I'm eternally secure. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. All right? That's there. What about the time of Jacob's trouble? What happens if you take the mark of the beast? And don't give me this, well, no true Christian would take the mark of the beast. Okay. Again, as I've said in many studies, that puts you in contradiction with 1 Timothy chapter 5, where Paul says, If any provide not for his own, especially for they of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. I'm supposed to provide for my own. But the Revelation 13 says no man can buy or sell unless you take the mark. And we're going to see here in just a minute or two. If you take the mark, you go to hell. How does that work? It doesn't work out. Christians aren't going to be in the time of Jacob's trouble. Very important to understand that. Okay? So you see the thing of there's a new aspect of fearing God there. Right? Uh, the second part there. Uh, the hour of his judgment is come. Um, my hour of judgment happened when I put my faith in Jesus Christ on the cross. My judgment was Jesus' death on the cross. You understand that? His suffering on the cross is the suffering that I would have had to do had I died in my own self-righteousness. He bled and died on the cross. He died for sins. You understand? So my hour of judgment has already come and gone. Now, the only judgment I'm going to have to face is the judgment seat of Christ, which is where my works get judged. But I'm not going to be judged. But the people that go into the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, they're going to have a new level of judgment that comes upon them. They're going through God's wrath being poured out on the lost world. His judgment upon the lost world. Why? Because everybody that goes into the time of Jacob's trouble rejected Jesus Christ. There aren't going to be, well, oh man, that village was destroyed over there. There were some Christians in there. Uh-uh. When God's worldwide judgment came the first time, God looked down and said, are there any righteous men down here? Oh, Noah, his wife, their th three of their sons, and their three wives. Noah could have had other children. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. There were other relatives, though, certainly of Noah down there. And God looks down and says, oh, no, sorry, you don't make it. Noah and his little family there. Eight people. 
um, bef you know, and they were taken through the you know time there. They weren't called up to heaven and stuff like that. I realized that, but uh, that was worldwide judgment number one. Worldwide judgment number two is not going to be 40 days and 40 nights. It's seven years. Seven years of God's judgment and fury coming upon the earth. And there's not going to be many Christians that escape it. Okay, why? Because there aren't that many Christians. <laughs> Real true Christians. Uh, just like Jesus said, you know, again, people go, You heretic! You heretic! Jesus Christ said it. What are you getting on my case for? You know? <laughs> I mean, good night, people. You know, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Jesus said it. Don't blame me. You know, I didn't write the King James Bible. I know some people probably think I did, you know. Probably think it's some kind of vast conspiracy that I'm actually, uh, um, you know, created from the DNA of the translators or something, or King James, and, you know, and, and spliced with Ruckman's DNA and Theodore Herzl that founded the Jews, you know, the, the Zionist movement and stuff like this and I'm like genes spliced from all of them or something apparently according to some of these people I probably just started a new rumor there's gonna be like five videos on it now but uh, <laughs> but uh, you know and then of course worship him uh, worship him is you know we we are supposed to worship the Lord um, but again a different a, a different angle to it when you're going through his judgment it's gonna be kind of an odd thing for those people uh, so the everlasting gospel is definitely not what we have today. And let's show you the further proof of that. Uh, okay, yeah, I forgot to mention this scripture. Romans chapter 8. Pretty bad when you don't even follow your own notes. Terrible. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So, the hour of judgment, there's no condemnation to me. All right? And when you walk in the flesh, when you start to mess around with fleshly sins, you get a little carnal, God will correct you. He'll spank you, so to speak. All right? He'll just kind of whack you. Don't stop doing that. You know, um, That's there. But I'm not going through with the hour of judgment. Like the people in Revelation chapter 14. But let's go to Revelation 14 verse 8. It says here, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Hmm. Wait a second. Turn to Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Wait a second here. Did it happen twice? No. Um, the books of Revelation, or the, excuse me, the chapters of Revelation, there's only one book, the chapters of Revelation are not chronological. Okay? As I said before, you have Revelation 14, verse 8, describing the same exact event that happens over in chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. So you get people, they try to say the expository study through the whole thing, and they say it's all just going in order and stuff like this. They're making a mess of the Bible. Uh, it's not chronological, right? You have to understand that. Just need to, you know, point that out. But we need to look at this verse, verse eight. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, the Vatican, because she made all na nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. I found that to be very interesting. She made them drink. How does she do that? Through infiltration. The Jesuit order, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, all these different Roman Catholic orders, they get in there and they, they work in the Knights of Malta and the Knights of Columbus and all these other secret orders and things. They're getting in there and they're messing these nations up. And they will regularly do things that you can't, you know, you can't get around it. Okay, they will you know just take the integration thing. They forcibly integrate nations with... with Muslims and things like this mess up the culture. That's what they're doing. 
Um, they'll they'll do all kinds of stuff. You know, again, I mean, this is this is it's not my feelings or my opinions or my conspiratorial paranoia or something. It's documented facts. You look at the people that are overthrowing things and, and bringing stuff in. They're Jesuit educated. They're Roman Catholic. They're Knights of Columbus. They're Knights of Malta. It's right there. But people don't like it. But, uh, you know, and the fact of the matter is there, she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You read in Revelation 17, this great city commits fornication with the kings of the earth. You know, she's scheming. She's all the time just, just messing around, getting in bed with this nation and that nation and getting all business deals and all this other stuff. Um, I'm here to tell you something, which is actually kind of an encouragement, if you really want to look at it this way. Uh, this, there's a teaching, you know, this, this thing of the five kingdoms in, in the book of Daniel. You can do this study on that. I, I do have other videos, you know, where I've talked a little bit more in detail about it. But they say there are five kingdoms. Four have been the head of gold, the chest of silver, the uh, arms of brass, I think it is. Um, the, getting this mixed up here, the, the legs of iron, the feet of part iron, part miry clay, ten toes. And they say that four kingdoms have been, you know, and you had uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and then you had the Media Persian, and then you had the Greek, and then you had the Roman, the Iron Legions of Rome, and now we're waiting for the fifth kingdom. No, we're not. No, we're not. Um, we're actually in the end of the fifth kingdom. Uh, that time of the Roman Catholic rule is actually almost over. Uh, she's been scheming. That's why you read the, you know, this fifth kingdom is part strong, part weak. Um, there's been times that the Roman Catholic Church has had total control. Other times they've lost that total control. Other times, it, you know, they've not been that powerful. And they've had problems and dissension and things like that. So, we're in that fifth kingdom, and we have been ever since the supposed fall of Rome, uh, way back, I think it was, what, the fourth century, or, I think, or something like that. You know, when Rome, Imperial Rome, became Catholic, Papal Rome. The Caesar became Pope, you know, essentially. Pontificus Maximus. You know, that's... I mean, you do the study. It's there. But I just find it interesting because you think to yourself, you know, well, well, you feel kind of disconnected sometimes from the Bible. It's like, no, we're actually in the fifth kingdom. The fifth kingdom has been the longest one, the longest lasting. So... And they're just about ready to fall, which is a wonderful thing. But let's, let's look at uh, verses 9 through 11 here, okay? Because this ties in with the everlasting gospel. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, notice it says any man, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So verse 9 says, any man. Verse 11 says, whosoever receiveth the mark. Again, I've gone over this in so many studies, I'm not going to cover it again. Um, that proves 100% Christians cannot be there in this time. Why? Because Ephesians chapter 1 says that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. All right? We are sealed. You can't lose your salvation today as a Christian. But this one says if you take the mark, you're damned to hell. All right? You've got to get a hold of that thing. All right? Um... Which, you know, another thing there, you know, the thing of uh, another one of the big arguments, which again I've covered in many studies, but we're here in this text, I have to cover it again. Um, they say, you know, uh, well, the wrath is the second part of the tribulation, and so we go through the first part. We're pre-wrath. There's a pre-wrath rapture and stuff. Again, stupid nonsense. When the Antichrist shows up, he's going to require people to take that mark. And the Bible says right here, verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. You take the mark in verse 9, you get the wrath of God in verse 10. So you are, the wrath of God is there from the very beginning. All right, so somebody takes the mark, they're getting God's wrath. We're not appointed to wrath. 
See, comparing Scripture with Scripture. You know, people come out and they, they just lie. I mean, there's the, the level of lying and deception right now is just... It, oh, brother, I mean, where do you even begin? It's crazy. But uh, notice also there, verse 11, The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Okay? So these people that come out and they say, Hell's not eternal. Uh, you know, it's right there forever and ever. You know, just insane people out there today. Verse 12, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Two things present there in the time of Jacob's trouble. All right. Just so plain. Let's go back to Hebrews. You know, it, it just, it's almost getting insulting after a while, you know, some of the, the people that I get that are, you know, attacking the ministry and they're just going, you know, you can't prove this, you can't prove that. And I'm going, you know, they say, can you prove to me that the book of Hebrews is written to Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble? Um, what's the name of the book again? Hebrews. There's neither Jew nor Greek, you know, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Why would you name a book Hebrews, and why would you put doctrines in it that are clearly lining up with Revelation 14, 9 through 11, and verse 12, specifically verse 12. Let's look at that. Some people just don't get it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. You know, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. It's talking to Jews. You read the book, it's talking to Jews. It's very, very plain, very obvious. I mean, okay, we get raptured, we get called out as Christians. What scriptures are going to be there for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble? You know, Hebrews. If we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. Have you ever sinned after you got saved? Oh, and, and see, then they'll get into these little games. They go... Yes, but it was not willfully or something or, you know, it's insanity. Just read the Bible and believe what you're reading, okay? And that sounds difficult, I know. You know, just believe the English that you're reading. You know, and again, you know, you get the new versionists and they say, you know, you have to go back to the Greek and the Hebrew. Why? Because I can't understand the English. It's too archaic. Yeah, well, going back to Greek and Hebrew is going to help you. You know, that's that's going to make things a lot clearer. Because, you know, Greek and Hebrew are far easier to understand than a word that ends with eth. Believeth, you know, or something. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 6. See another thing about the mark of the beast here. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. A Jew gets saved. A Hebrew, you know, Hebrew gets saved in the time of Jacob's trouble. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. You know, they do the whole thing. They're trying to keep the commandments according to Revelation 14, verse 12. And uh, in that time there, now they take the mark of the beast. They, they back off. They take the mark of the beast. Um, they fell away. It's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Let me ask you a question there, Christian. When you fall away, is it possible for you to come back to the Lord? Yeah. Then why would you think that the book of Hebrews is written to you? It's not. It's written to a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. Could it be any clearer? Revelation chapter, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. 
While it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. A lot of the new virgins will take, say, they take out not. They'll say, all that came out of Egypt by Moses. They take out the word not. Because they're satanic. They're Catholic Bibles. But, very interesting, we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. How does that line up with the time of Jacob's trouble? Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. Okay, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Do you have to endure to the end of anything to be saved? No. Do I have to endure to the end of anything to be saved? No. I'm saved because of the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, washed away my sins. It's a one-time event. I don't have to worry about falling away and losing my salvation. If I fall away from the Lord, if I mess around with the flesh, He'll correct me as His Son. Well, then we have to reconcile the book of Hebrews and Revelation to what we have today. No, you don't. No, you don't. You rightly divide. And you don't have to go in there and say, well, you know, uh, you know, another one of the famous ones is they'll say, you can go back to Revelation 14, by the way. They'll say, um, you know, it says, if they shall fall away. That's just a hypothetical thing. If they could fall away, then this bad stuff would happen. But see, a Christian can't fall away because their righteousness is imputed. The Bible's not supposed to be that difficult to understand, okay? The Holy Spirit moves in. He's going to help you to understand things in there. And you get these people and they're like just twisting it and contorting it. And, and it says call upon the Lord, but it's actually believe on the Lord. And, and they just tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak. You know, the Bible, you know, prayer is a work. Okay, show me that in Scripture. You know. Nuts. They're tr just crazy. Verse 13. He, or, yeah, Revelation 14, verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Hmm. So what's the instruction in righteousness for us? 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 6 and 8 or 6 through 8, excuse me. For I, am now, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Give me a hearty amen to that one, yeah. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Are you looking forward to the rest that's going to come from your labors as a Christian? 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. It says here, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself shall, should be a castaway. Yeah. The labors that you're going through right now, the, the arguments with family members and friends and people, you know, casting out your name as evil and all the other stuff, um, you're going to get to rest from those labors, and I believe very soon. I really think that time is very short. So just a little bit of an instruction in righteousness there. They're going to rest from their labors in the time of Jacob's trouble. Back in Revelation 14, you can go back there. You know, that they may rest from their labors and their works to follow them. Um, our works are going to follow us. You see, when the rapture happens, uh, there's going to be a lot of people down here on the earth that uh, they weren't saved. And that's why you see so much, you know, I, I see this thing with atheists and things, and I understand the confusion. They say, why do Christians always attack each other? Christians aren't attacking each other. Christians are attacking false converts. False converts attack Christians. There's a war there. You say, well, how do you tell the difference between the two? Well, uh, who lines up with the book? Well, they quote Scripture too, yeah. But you see, they're quoting it falsely. 
And when you're saved, you'll understand that. You get saved God's way. You get saved the Bible way. He'll open up your understanding. He'll open up the scriptures to you. And you'll, you'll be like, yeah, okay, I understand that. Uh, you know, again, again, I hear this thing, and you know, and I, I've seen this many times. Somebody will come out and they'll say, oh, I'm a King James Bible-believing preacher. And, you know, you try to listen to them and you're just like, yeah, it's, some of the stuff that they're saying sounds good, but I don't know what it is. Something just, something bothers me. I don't know what that thing is. And, you know, sometimes it just, whatever, I try to have grace for people. I have a lot more grace than people realize. And, uh, you know, you just kind of go along with what they're saying. Well, I'm not going to come out and condemn them or whatever else, but, you know, you watch them and watch them and, you know, I'm saying I don't watch a lot of false prophets. I really don't watch that many. I have better things to do with my time, but, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's frustrating sometimes how many false teachers are out there. Um, that gets that gets on my nerves after a while because there's a lot. It's pretty bad right now. I'm not perfect. And I appreciate people that say, you know, I don't agree with you and everything, brother, but I know your heart is there. You're, you're trying to serve the Lord. I appreciate that. I mean, we can agree to disagree on some issues, but, you know, doctrinally, the Bible's pretty, pretty, uh, that's what I'm looking for. Um, it's, it's, we're not supposed to agree, uh, disagree on major points of doctrine and things is what I'm saying. The Bible's very sure. That's what I was thinking. Um. But well, let's continue here. Revelation chapter 14, verses 14 through 20. All right. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, saying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even under the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand six and six hundred furlongs. Okay. Um, now I want to say a couple things here. All right. Uh, you know, first of well, I'll, I'll get back to that then. Um, this is one area where I differ. Another, you know, one of a few areas where I differ with uh, Peter Ruckman. Peter Ruckman teaches that there are two raptures. There's the saints before the you know time of Jacob's trouble and then there's saints during the time here towards the end basically that there's a post trib rapture of Jews and you know tribulation saints I don't agree with that um, I don't believe that this harvest that happens here I don't read anything about them being caught up okay they're simply taken someplace let me show you the scripture tie-ins here Okay, let me show you why people think it means caught up, why there's a rapture thought there. Matthew chapter 24, verse 40 through 42. Then shall be two in the field, and the one, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. So they say, one's taken, the other's left. That's the rapture. It's clearly a rapture. No, it's not. And I'll prove it. Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, verses 34 through 37. You're going to see a parallel here to the thing of one taken, one left, and things. Look at this. Luke 17, verse 34. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, the one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Okay, you see it there. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Now look at this. Here's the key to it. This is where it's defined what this taken thing means. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? 
Why are they taken, in other words? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. What's that a reference to? Revelation 19. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 19, verse 17 through 21 says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, and the armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that had worshipped, or them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Where the eagles are gathered together, that's where they're taken. You just read about it. Okay? What's going on there? Well, in Revelation 14, you have, first he goes in and he harvests those faithful Jews that are there. And they're going to be coming to the judgment of the nations in Matthew chapter 25. They're, they're you know, brought to that thing. But see, the remnant of them, they flee out into the wilderness when they see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. I mean, there's so many proofs against this whole thing of Christians go into this tribulation thing. You know, if you aren't convinced by now after watching my videos, well, sorry, feel bad for you, but actually I don't, but you know, it's another thing. But the Jews are going to be taken out into the wilderness. Some say the city, this ancient city of Petra or whatever out there in the wilderness, this, but this valley there where this battle of Armageddon is going to be fought, there the Lord gathers them and says, come on, flee from the Antichrist. The Antichrist army is coming out to wipe out those Jews and ultimately to do battle with Jesus and us, his saints, that come back with him. And it's at that time that the Lord says, okay, first I gather together the Jews, and then he is gathering together the Antichrist army. Why? Well, if you've ever seen uh, people doing wine by feet, not by hand, but by feet, <laughs> Uh, they get in there and they just stomp and stomp and stomp as hard as they can, smashing those grapes up. And what comes out? The blood of the grapes. You know, and I, I saw this comment recently and some guy said, he said, you're so judgmental, you judge harsher than God does. Um, uh, you might want to get to know the Lord a little bit, okay? I don't judge half as hard as the Lord does. The videos I make where I condemn sins and things like that and I say this is wickedness, this is wrong, this is satanic, that's child stuff, okay? That's just, that's nothing at all. You're dealing with a God here that's going to literally take a 200 million man army and just slaughter it and then ride down through it. Riding his horse through a sea of, of dead bodies splashing up on him, blood splashing on him. And he tells us to do Hey, come on, let's go. And we're riding through it too. UN peacekeeping forces, arms, legs, eyeballs, guts, feet, heads, severed heads floating on top. Right through it. Up to the horse bridle. Your legs are going to be in it. And I'm cruel. I'm crueler than God. I don't think so. Why would a loving God do a thing like that? Um, well, because he offers salvation, if you, and if you reject it, you're on Satan's side. Oh, I'm not such a bad person. It's not what God says. James chapter 5, we're going to end here. James chapter 5, verses 7 through 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. 
Well, that's going to be for the uh, Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. But uh, we're talking about instruction and in righteousness right now for Christians. And you know what, brethren? Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. Are you bearing fruit for Jesus Christ? Have you gotten away from the Lord? Are you working as hard as you could be for the Lord? Have you passed up passed up opportunities to pass out gospel tracts? Who are you to judge me? I'm judging myself right now too. God's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. Instruction and righteousness for us, brethren. Oh, bro Brother Ryan, I'm just going through some really big stressful stuff right now and I... I've been watching more TV than I probably should, and I've been I've been kind of I haven't been reading my Bible as much and things. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. I'm not saying you got to read your Bible all the time, brethren. Uh, God created this beautiful world out here for us to enjoy. You know, it's not for the lost people. It's for us to go out and say, "Wow, pray I praise you, Lord." You know, one of the greatest praise and worship services that you can have is when you walk out into nature and you look at every little thing that you can and you say, that's amazing, Lord. Look at that. Look at that flower. I mean, walk up to a flower sometime. It's a great way to convince people you're nuts. Walk up to a flower sometime and just look at it. Up close. I mean, just look at the thing up close. Look at the, look at the fine detail in the petals of the flower and the pistil and the stamen and all the other parts of the flower and everything else. Look at that thing. You see a butterfly sometime? Look at that butterfly. Just, wow, Lord, that is amazing. Don't you like it when you do something, some kind of a project, or you make something, you cook something, or whatever else, and people go, that is, they just rave about it? It's how God feels when you rave about His creation. See? You understand? Yes, things are very vexing right now, brethren. Yes, things are heating up and you're just going like, I know a lot of you are suffering from anxiety, you're suffering from serious levels of depression and things. You're, you know, very horror, very, very, very horror, very heavy and have lots of sorrow. That's what I meant to say. But don't get carnal. See, you know, we, we, my wife and I have a lot of discussions and things. We talk about the Bible like all the time. Uh, it's just, it's our life. You know, what else do we have on this earth? Um, and, you know, we were talking about this, and I said, you know, I really don't think a carnal Christian is somebody that's messed up doctrinally. I think a carnal Christian is one that just says, puts it on the shelf and says, I'm going to go out and just do a bunch of stuff, and I'll get back to this when I can. But yet you talk to that Christian, and they believe the right things. But they've just kind of forsaken the work of the Lord. God's looking for fruit. And what you do in this life is going to mean everything in eternity. Your labor cannot be in vain. Do you understand that? There's never been one time when you've put out a tract or when you've witnessed to somebody or you've praised the Lord looking at His creation and things like that. Never one time did the Lord look down at that and say, Boy, you wasted your day. You can't waste your time serving Jesus Christ. Be also patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Yeah. Establish your hearts, brethren. I know what this book says. I'll stand on these promises. I'm established. I believe the Bible. People come along and they tell you, this is wrong and that's so you can't believe this and that, that's wrong and blah, blah, blah. you say no actually, actually I already learned that sorry I'm not giving it up actually the King James Bible is just to translate shut up get away from me sorry my heart's established I'm convinced well Jesus was just a man it, shut up go away sorry I got work to do I'm going to be out praising the Lord today I don't have time for you why for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh There are some things that I've tried to do recently, and I don't, I don't even need to get into it, that are just normal things that a husband and a father does. 
you know, and, and things, just things in this life and whatever else. Uh, big decisions for the future, and uh, those things fell through. And I look at it and I think, okay, what's the logical explanation for it? There isn't any. I did everything right. I did everything according to the way you should do whatever, whatever. Like I said, I'm not going to get into it. You know, personal decisions and things that I was trying to make for the betterment of my family. They didn't happen. And I say, okay, Lord, I don't really understand what's going on. And I'll tell you what, I can feel in my spirit. The Lord is saying, there's not much time left. Uh, the way that this world is going, I mean, it gets worse by the hour, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's going out of control, brethren. The coming of the Lord is drawing nigh. We're getting close. So spend the rest of your days, you know, um, doing the work of the Lord, bearing fruit. That's important. It's very important. And uh, it's, it's difficult. I won't be frank with you. You know. You know. You're going through it. It's very difficult right now to be a Bible-believing Christian, to see the world just just collapsing. You know. But it's encouragement to all of us. And you know, again, we've had this discussion. We have these discussions. And, uh, and you, you know, you start to get kind of frustrated sometimes because you say, there's just so much I want to do for the Lord. There's so many things I want to experience. There's so much... So many studies I want to do. So many books I wanted to read. I haven't read all these books yet. I'd, I'd love to have time to, you know. And you go, oh, man, I just, what if the Lord comes back? I, I didn't get this work done for Him, and I didn't do that. And you know what? All the Lord requires is for you to be found faithful. Are you going to be bearing fruit when the Lord comes back? The Lord comes down to the earth the first time, and He, speaking symbolically of Israel and he looks at the fig tree and he goes I'm hungry for a fig there's no figs on this tree curses the fig tree are you going to be a cursed Christian Lord comes back and says what'd you do for me and let me tell you something else I had a sister say this to me recently and it's very very true there are lost people that are starting to feel something they can feel. You know, they don't know what it is. It's a great opportunity to say, yeah, there is something coming. It's going to be a major, major change. It ain't going to be a world war. It isn't going to be an earthquake or a whatever, whatever. It's going to be the catching away of the bride of Christ. The most significant event ever in the history of man. Jesus' death on the cross is the most important. But it wasn't the most significant. What are, you, what are you talking about? There were people that didn't even know what happened. They weren't in the Jerusalem area there. They didn't even know what happened. When the rapture hits, there's not going to be any mystery. It's going to be quick. Boom. Up we go. And then all those chances that you had, all the times that you start to get kind of frustrated, and you will get frustrated. You are frustrated. I know. I'm frustrated. But we have to continue to do the work of the Lord. He's coming. He's coming soon. That is going to be it. Um, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, um, I always thank you, Lord, for your word. I just can't imagine the spiritually dark condition that we would all be in if we had no authoritative standard uh, in your word. I just... I just Shudder to think, Lord, of, of how bad it would be to just not know what's coming, not know why the world is in the condition it's in. But we do know, Lord, and we do understand that our time is drawing very short now where the work that we have to do for you, um, the time's going to come when we aren't going to be able to do any more work for you. We'll be in heaven. And, Lord, I know we all long for that day, but it sure is getting tough down here, Lord. And I... Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to feel some of that suffering that you felt before you died on the cross. And um, I don't know what we're going to have to go through yet, Lord, before you uh, catch us away from this wicked planet. It could get really, really bad for us Christians. I don't know. But, uh, Lord, I pray that you would help all of us to fight hard.
harder than we've ever fought before. As we see the, the time drawing to an end, our time on earth. And that you would encourage each of us and convict each of us of the things that we're doing wrong. And um, help us to clean up our lives in preparation for meeting you face to face. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that is going to be it. Um, you sound like I'm stepping on something there. I uh, thought I dropped something on the floor there. Sorry about that. But uh, just wanted to encourage everybody out there. Uh, it's just like stuff is getting so weird. I mean, it, you know, it gets to the point where, you know, the, I think sometimes the best thing you can do is just laugh at how bad this world's getting. You know, don't try to figure it out. You can't, you know, don't don't try to think, well, you know, maybe we can pull this thing off, you know, and Donald Trump's going to help us out. <laughs> Come on. So that is going to be it. I thank you very much for your prayers. I thank you uh, for... Uh, the letters of encouragement and things to keep us going. Um, the folks that donate to the ministry, thank you. Uh, let's hold each other up in prayer, prayer brethren. I mean, we're kind of like, we're coming down to the, the home stretch here, so to speak, you know, and, and uh, I don't know, I just, you know, it's just, the things are just so nuts, is what I'm trying to say. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.